We're a go. We are a go. So welcome back, uh, viewers, to my, uh, what is my channel? I guess I'm Scott Robertson Design uh, YouTube channel. So this is my uh, free tutorial Friday this week. And uh, Neville is back visiting me today in the studio. Hello. And uh, we decided, since we're both here, and we both have 20 minutes free, <laughs> <laughs> just 20 minutes, we would uh, jump in and do another uh, sketchbook tour, uh, similar to the one that we did with another one of my sketchbooks. And so I grabbed another one. Uh, I think there will be only, right now, only two more of these left because I only have two more sketchbooks that are full. So You're going to have to buy some more. I'm going to have to do another one. Um, Actually, the latest one's almost full, and it's only three weeks old, so... Oh, my God. That's not I, so bad. I hate you. No, it isn't so bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's only because I've been working every single day trying to finish this How to Draw book with, Tom, yeah. with Thomas Bertling, and it's been, you know... Oh, it's going to be great. Kicking my butt. I can't wait. It's everything that we have been doing as instructors for the past 17, 18 years? Yeah, teaching? actually uh, 18 years now. Uh, we started teaching in 95. In Switzerland. January, yeah, January 95. So, yeah, we're, we're coming up on uh, qualifying as old men, I think. I can see your gray beard is, is, is coming in as nicely as mine is. <laughs> the, gray, the only gray hair left on my face because the hair on top of my head that was once gray is gone. Yeah, mine is uh, so gray. It's, it's crazy. Anyway, uh, a sketchbook tour. Let's go. So uh, I want to point out one thing about the sketchbook. Yeah. For the most part, I haven't seen almost all of these. And you quickly thumbed through some of this earlier. And you've posted yeah. a few. On... I posted a lot online. Uh, really, yeah. on my Instagram, I post tons of sketches, even as I do them. Um, like you know, sketching at home, I'll just I'll snap a shot as I'm going. And those mm -hmm. are the ones that are not you know they're not nicely scanned because they're Instagram. They're always photographs from right. the camera, so they're all usually distorted and whacked. But um, so a lot of them have shown up that way. But I don't think um, any of these. Oh, don't ruin it. I don't know. I can ruin it. I'm flipping Thank fast. Um, it's like don't... playing a movie in reverse. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> None of these um, are currently in any of my books. So none of these sketches have made it into a Design Studio Press book yet. Oh, and, and will they? Uh, yes. Yeah, some of them are going into the How to Draw book. Okay. Um, but others, uh, no, yeah, nothing in this book. So I have enough sketches. I actually have enough sketches probably for another book. But no. Yeah, guaranteed. Anyway, let's, uh, let's flip some pages. There's little tank concepts I was working on just for, you know, passing the time, kind of fun of it, not for a project or anything. And then um, this, it, this is very similar to what the other sketchbook showed, and because it, it's the same process I use over and over again, which is to start with a little light marker, like, uh, like a Copic uh, T0, just dark enough for myself to see. Here's one that's a little darker, because that one probably got dry. You see getting dry, so I used a darker, like a you know, T3 or something. And, um, and this paper's pretty absorbent. Yeah, it's, you know what, it's, it's absorbent, but, but, but it, it doesn't, doesn't go through. No, it, it's, nice. um, it's this Strathmore uh, sketchbook. I love the paper. Um, I think it's their Series 300, I think. So it's a little lighter than the 400 series, mm -hmm. uh, which is a little too hard to like flip and hold flat while you're sketching. Um, but it, I always put a, a, you know, a piece of paper in between, like a heavy piece of copy paper. Mm -hmm. uh, so when it does bleed through, it doesn't ruin the next page. Yeah. Um, but you can see it. it it bleeds through, but it doesn't actually go through that that much. Um, I mean, the marker bleeds a little, but you come back and hold it together with a heavy line weight. Um, and if you really want to do a nice sketch in the sketchbook, you can come back with gouache. And that's what the blue is there. And there's some white around the legs. Actually. And you get some black gouache in there, don't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I tend to use a lot of the jet black. That's what I use. Um, if you really want to make those areas you know, as dark as possible, that's a great one. Um, and you can see there's a lot of marker running over, but it's okay because once I scan that, then I would go back and use, uh, you know, color dodge that uh, to pure white and or airbrush. But usually color dodge works well to get rid of the over, the marker sort of overdrawing, you know, past. And then you have a black line, and so it you won't kill your black line. So it's a way to sort of quickly go in and clean up those edges. Very cool. So those are some uh, little walkers. This is something I was, I was working on for a while. John Park, my old student, um, he's now working for uh, Hawken mm -hmm. with Kang Lee. And um, we were talking about doing a you know, mechs yeah. for a book. But, of course, neither of us have ever had time to actually do enough of them to make a book. But someday, maybe. So this was my start into that subject matter. These are actually some of the first mechs I've actually drawn. What do you mean? Like, ever? Uh, yeah. Wow. I, didn't, I was not like ever like a mech guy. Um, 
you know, into robots and, yeah. and tanks. I never drew tanks. I like to try to vehicles, but not really tanks. Um, so these are, yeah, these are actually some of the first. It's interesting, just purely from a technique standpoint, you get this higher contrast just by virtue of choosing a different value marker. Yeah, you know why? Because the T3 I was using back here, right, ran out. Ran out. <laughs> <laughs> and I was left with like a five. Right, and yeah. I was, um, I can't remember where, I think it was in Toronto at the time when I was sketching these, because my wife was editing a movie there, mm -hmm. and I, it's all I had, and I still like to draw that way, um, it's, it's really tough with it, like a, this is a, the, the fine line is a, um, what a high tech, pilot high tech, and it's tough to do a drawing that way initially with that pen, so it's always easier for me to block it in with a little marker. It's interesting though, because if you look at this leg, for example. Yep which the marker indicates a very different leg uh -huh. than what the high-tech is. So what, what is your decision-making process of, once you have the basic general silhouette, which I think is what you're getting from the marker, Yeah. how are you selecting and choosing the detail or the final design? Well, um, if I think it looks bad, uh, <laughs> I don't, you, you don't do then that, I don't right? do that, exactly. Okay. So it's, it's very sophisticated. And it's it the, takes, mix, it the takes, Michelangelo philosophy. Yeah, exactly. I remove all the marble that doesn't belong. Yes, and then I just outline what's left. Yeah. Got it. Um, even though the silhouette there didn't really help me at all to do what I outlined. It really started with this leg, and then I just mirrored it over to the other side, mm -hmm. ignoring the marker. Yeah. Because of the, you can see I sort of followed the marker on the near side. Right. And then that just became wrong, and so I just, I just drew gotcha. it more properly. But you can see like that one very lightly right there. That wasn't working, so I ignored it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's usually that it's it's making a decision about the bigger silhouette and the bigger proportions, and that's how I eliminate or choose what to outline or not. Okay. Those are just notes that I like to do. If I'm trying to design, like say I was doing this for a theater, theoretical game or something, I like to, to write notes and give myself a little list of things to draw. By the way, if you go back before I start to draw, that's kind of what my sketchbook looks like. Is that would, is that what it's happening right now? Maybe just, that <laughs> with the occasional little mechanical sketch. Yeah. Um, or this. It looks like this. Yeah. White paper. I, that's that's how they always start. So in this guy, I don't know if you can see on camera, but I see white gouache. Yeah, there's a lot of white gouache on there. Um, all around the... All the way around. Perimeter. It's because there was a lot of marker, loose marker that was very light, but um, it, it was distracting. And so I was like, you know, I could probably do some cleanup in the original sketch and not have to do it all in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I like to do that because then when you look through the, the original sketchbook, it's um, it still has some visual appeal. Yeah. Um, even though it's it's you know sort of white, you can definitely see it's painted, but I still think it looks nice um, as opposed to seeing all the marker yeah. around it. Yeah. It's, yeah. I only just caught it at a glance. I, I don't even mind. It kind of adds a nice you know sort of texture and patina to the page actually. Mm -hmm. So this is a lot of times how it starts for me. If I haven't drawn like the the gap between drawing here and here was maybe three months. Uh -huh. I hadn't drawn anything. Okay. And um, so then I was like, and I always have this, well, we have our project, right? The Hot Rods of Another World. Yeah. And I'm so excited about that. Don't so know someday. When that's going to happen. Someday. Yeah. This is no, no, uh, no spoiler because the likelihood of it ever happening is, <laughs> is slim. But we slim. Have, we but have a dream. Yes. So yeah, we've been talking a lot about doing this Hot Rods of Another World with uh, your sexy alien, you know, characters and my sci-fi hot rods so mm -hmm. this is always in the back of my mind oh yeah man, or maybe i'll revisit those sci-fi hot rods yeah well in a sketchbook is a, a great place to like experiment and fail because it's not typically never shown to the public right right so like this sketch would never go out uh in a book etc i'm showing now on my youtube channel for educational purposes so yeah i was going to ask because i know that when you're sketching you're typically not doing this layout and this is reminiscent of some of the stuff we taught with regards to dividing up a circle in perspective. What's that? Yeah, this is to figure out how to lay in uh, five spokes um, into a circle. So this is uh, 72 degrees, another 72 degrees. And then what you use is you use the height line. And if you look, then where this first 72 tick mark hits is about a third of the top half of the wheel. And then if you look where the bottom tick mark is, oh, it's about a quarter of the bottom half. So when I'm sketching over here, I can just draw the height line of the wheel, and then I can just estimate, oh, a third up or a quarter of the bottom. There's actually a little line across there. And right there, there's actually a line there and a line there, and that's where I put the tick marks straight across from each other, 
that makes it very easy for me to do a five spoke wheel in perspective. Mm -hmm. So I'm using the height line to calculate the position of those spokes. Or and I just it, totally guess into it sloppy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that, it's just yet another tool to yeah. keep, it, thing, keep mm -hmm. it looking a bit more accurate. So a lot of the ways I start when I'm rusty at drawing something is I start by drawing things that are real or similar to being real to get you know back to that feel of the proper proportions mm -hmm. and then quickly abstract and, and do a character you know sort of do a caricature of them and then again this is a little more real and then you'll see it's you know and then try it and if it's still not working maybe I'll try a different medium like this is a brush pen and it's just a nightmare to sketch cars with a brush oh, pen man. it's just the worst so that's why it only lasted yeah, two sketches. Two sketches. yeah. <laughs> And also, it's really tough to sketch with this pin. This is the Pilot High Tech. It's also, that's what this is. And again, not successful. All right? So it's okay. I mean, that's what your sketchbook's for, is to experiment and fail. Mm -hmm. Right? It's, you know, it's a friendly environment to do that in. Because um, usually nobody sees it. Yeah, it's your environment. Yeah. And then it still really wasn't happening. So I was like, you know what? I, I just, I got to go back to the ballpoint pen. And I'm going to try and draw some, some sort of XYZ forms to get me sort of in the, the rhythm of drawing some volumes again. Now, are you doing these sketches here for yourself, like you just said, to get back in the rhythm, or are you doing these as exercises for your your sketchbook, meaning your your book on how to draw? Oh, this one, no. None of this is the how to draw stuff. So this yet. is like this legitimate is just, you, Scott, yeah. drawing for yourself. Uh -huh. So you do do it. Yeah. Okay. No, just to like, you know, and, and you know, you see I only draw sort of what I need, but it is, it does help to get you sort of back, shake off the rust mm -hmm. and help to start to build, build volumes and yeah. perspective. Um, and also it's good because it takes away the design element that you might be struggling with and allows you just to work on um, draftsmanship. Yeah. So line quality, because it takes pages to like build back your sensitivity and your touch. Yeah after you haven't drawn for a while. And um, so there, there are a couple of big gaps in this sketchbook where I haven't drawn for quite a while. And um, this is one of the things I'll do to sort of get that, mm -hmm. that touch going again. And then you can see this sketch gets much better. Um, I start getting back a little bit of draftsmanship into the sketches. And so now, you know, still not quite the proportions I want here, but you can see now perspective building is getting a little bit more rhythmic, a little bit easier. Draftsmanship is a little bit better. The proportions are a little better. You know what's so smart about it? That's the one thing I remember when we were learning it, but also when we were teaching it in a formal sense. A lot of people don't have the patience for drawing a perspective. So consequently, you're hunting down the, the volumes and the design. Whereas if you take the time and have the foresight to slow down, and build a box that's the appropriate package and mm -hmm. volume, you actually are going to get to an end result that is more usable and much more accurate. Yeah. And, you know, it's okay. if it doesn't look good there, it's always just about, like, you know, it's just it's pushing and pulling on the surfaces. So you just do an overlay on top of that. There's really no reason, if it's drawn accurately here, to not use that accurate grid and that accurate perspective. So mm -hmm. I could just go make a Xerox copy of this, right? And then I could draw right over the top. And just focus in on fixing the things that I don't like. Yeah. Stretch the nose a bit, make it a little wider, you know, narrow this up a bit. Just tweak and push because it's, you know, the good looking car is still in that same perspective. Yeah. It's just not right. that one. Right? <laughs> and so what you need to do is say, well, okay, well, if I don't have to change all the wheels again, the wheels are not going to change from the good looking one to this one. Mm -hmm. Right. I just need to push and pull the surfaces a bit and maybe change the graphics. All, you know, it's very subtle. Yeah. Um, so you can just do that in an overlay. It's no reason to rebuild the whole thing. Now, what about scale of drawing? Because if you go back, yeah. this one's pretty small. Yeah, it's super inch, tiny. Inch and a half, two inches. Uh -huh. And then, obviously here, significantly well, bigger. Yeah, a lot bigger. Um, almost the, the maximum of my sketchbook is probably about eight, almost eight inches. Um, the thing is that uh, what's interesting it's well, okay. It's easier to draw a straight line that's short. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and on the one hand, doing a perspective like this is easier because those lines, right, are easier to draw when they're only this long. Yeah. Okay. And you go over here. Now these lines are going to be this long. You know, those guidelines all this. That's tougher. Right. right. But if you want to draw something like a car that has details, let's say I wanted to detail a wheel, for instance, mm -hmm. and the wheel's only this big, I'm not really going to be able to put a wheel design in there. Yeah. Right. Or an engine. But if it's this big, now I can actually start to do the, the cooling fins on this engine. I can do, uh, I could actually do spokes. I could, you know, yep. detail that. That wheel is about the same size as the entire car. Yeah. So 
that really, uh, especially when you're drawing cars, w drawing them larger is very helpful to draw the details, especially, you know, look how small that front end is in the car. You know, drawing is almost my whole sketchbook. So mm -hmm. to draw that, you almost have to do it as a separate drawing yeah. in detail or draw larger. Before you go on, yeah, you know, talking about drawing the details, etc. There's something that I'm noticing that's showing up in a lot of your sketches. You got a numbering system that's around your oh, design. Yeah. It might be worth pointing out why you do that. So those are, you see them, I think they're in frame here. Yeah, these are actually at the bottom of this page. Um, so these are the degrees of the ellipses. And so let's say I wanted to do uh, an overlay. Say I wanted to blow up this sketch, right? and do an overlay on top and make it larger so I could draw those details mm -hmm. and make it, you know, a big 11 by 17 or yeah. something or even larger. Um, I know that I just have to go grab a 45 degree ellipse guide, a 35 and a 55, mm -hmm. for instance. Yeah. And so I just put them there because it makes it easier later. Um, and the other thing do, it does as well is you can start to remember these combinations. Like if it's a perspective view, you draw a lot. Mm -hmm. um, if I, you know, sort of raise up the camera or drop it down, the degrees of these basically stay the same through that range. And so I know if I just always grab like a 60, 50, and 35, mm -hmm. right? A 10 degree change from this side to this side and a 15 from, you know, right. near, near corner to the other corner. Um, that's a system where I can always just have those three ellipse guides around if I'm drawing that perspective a lot, because those are probably the same ones here. Yeah. Um, even though you know, it doesn't matter if it's front view or rear view, um, but so that's probably the exact same set of ellipse guides, or similar. And so now here it's getting a little more sci-fi, maybe a little bit more appropriate for our project, mm -hmm. our theoretical project someday. And these, you can see, there's not much in the way of guidelines now. My sort of draftsmanship mojo has is, is come back into you know, practice at this point. But you saw how many pages it took to get it sort of you know, going. What's interesting, too, on these... At, at first glance, the assumption is it's just a dead orthographic side view, but there's something to the untrained eye that makes it feel dimensional, which is mm. actual one point perspective, but kind of on a cheat. Yeah. I mean, you have you have an, an a horizon line or an eye line or a vanishing point, obviously, I think. Um, yeah, well, obviously, because we see a little bit of the shadow, mm -hmm. right? And we see the far side tires. Mm -hmm. It's the way, actually, for me to show this is a hubless wheel. So you can see the tire on the other side, and to show that hole is to show the tire on the other side. As well as the underside of the... Um... Yes. So, yeah, you see through the windows and you see the, the far side, you know, of inside through the glass, if you choose to draw the glass. They're not all that. Yeah. Um, just to think that one But it is just, it's just a tick that just gives Just a little bit of dimension thickness. here, a little bit of dimension there. Um, and the thing is with this, it's got very much a very strong center line. So, and this even has a, a center break in the windshield. It's like two planes of glass. And so there really isn't much to see across the width of the car. So really you're drawing kind of the corner at the back because it's wider. And then that's what you see here because of the one point. And then here really, you, you really do see the true center line. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, it's weird. If you drew this in top view and you said, what do you see in the silhouette? It'd be a weird line that jogs from the yeah. corner over to the center line, then back to the nose. Right. Which I should do that drawing some point. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. My, I have that in my sketchbook for my drawing book, but it's a bear to do as accurately. Right, this, was, this was actually a totally out of order sketch page. It's a really awful page. And it's totally, I jumped, I don't know why, I don't really, not very good about how I organize my sketchbook, but I jumped in and did this sketch way far into my sketchbook. Then I caught up to it. And filled it up. So this is not in the order. Did, did you do this for Viscom One like I don't know. 10 years it's really, ago? It's really bad, isn't it? <laughs> but it came after like, so totally out of order. It's not, I, did, uh, I wasn't, didn't go from that to this. And yeah. go, you know. Backwards. I didn't go backwards. So there I skipped. So yeah. now this was the next page after those. Okay. Days. And you see the, the constructions are getting a little bit more complex. Um, still have my ellipse guides measured out there. And, um, you know, now we're into sort of a, well, this is kind of three point. I have a tendency to always draw in curvilinear perspective, right? And what that is, is where, you know, you know what it is. Of I think I do. You, you do. <laughs> um, where uh, you're bending, right? It's almost always three point or four point or five point, actually. Um, if we see if there's one later, we could see some that are five point. Mm -hmm. We can talk about that later. Anyway, so it's are all ballpoint pen sketches, more complex. Again, same theme. I think that one's actually painted up. I actually have a tutorial on the channel painting this one or something similar to it. That's easy. 
That one, I know. That was, <laughs> oh, a, that was a bit of a bear. Uh, but, you know, I like to challenge myself sometimes, even though it's probably at the expense of the design. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I just like to build things. Like It's like model building, yeah. right? And so this is more about the fun in building the yep. shape, yeah. not with uh, an emphasis on making it a perfect design, knowing that if I get an interesting foundation and an interesting perspective, it's probably easier to do an overlay and refine the aesthetics yeah. later. Um, but I just like the challenge of trying to draw something. You said that this was a total bear, because I remember teaching a class in Switzerland where we were doing a similar thing. Bears? You're drawing bears? No, it was no. funny, because we I was teaching how to draw in perspective animals, quadrupeds. Mm -hmm. And the student was doing this horse in this really awkward position. It was totally difficult. And as I was walking around the class looking at stuff, I walked over to him and said, oh my God, that's a bear. No, it's not, it's a horse. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a moment of like, whoops, okay, Oops. I guess, yeah. Lost in translation. Lost in translation. Yes. <laughs> that's a bear. It's that's, a horse. That's perfect. All right. So, <laughs> Whatever so that's not a bear, that's a, that's a hot rod. Mm -hmm. With some sort of totally made up engine, of course. Those aren't bears either. No, these are not bears. Um, these are, I don't know what, these are... Uh, it doesn't matter. These are quadrupeds. These are cool. Actually, these are, these are quadrupeds um, with a brush pen. So this is a different technique, actually. Um, this is using a non-photo blue pencil, which is a very classic uh, animator's technique. Yeah. To rough in the, the gesture and get the pose right, and then you ink it after, and then you would apply color and things after that. Common animators and also um, comic Com books. Yeah, definitely comic books, yeah. yep, same. And so this allows you to investigate... Um, in something that effectively you can fade away by the time you go over it. And the reason it used to be that way was because they would shoot it with a black and white camera in the production process, all the blue would disappear. Mm -hmm. And now it doesn't really make any sense to use a non-photo blue pencil yeah. and do a scan of this because on a scanner, it still all reads. Right. And um, anyway, but it's still kind of fun. You end up with this sort of like weird little uh, blue glow yeah. on your sketch. Um, which, of course, you could just make it grayscale in Photoshop and get rid of that. So that's, a, that's kind of a bit of everything. Starts with a non-photo blue pencil, then some marker. It's a bad idea to use markers over colored pencil. Mm -hmm. All right? You can ruin your markers that way. Um, then a little uh, black brush pen, and then gouache, actually. There's quite a bit of black and white on there. And this is experimenting with different mediums. So that's gouache, uh, marker with a bit of white gouache, a bit of black gouache, and... I, I want to know what this yeah, page that was. Yeah, that, that was not a good page. <laughs> yeah, that was a really bad page, so that's what's left of it. That was an actual that bear. That one's gone, yes. Goodbye. And then a little graphite sketch. And then this was actually during uh, Hurricane Sandy. Yeah, that's right. So, I remember you were doing so these. So there's a big gap from there now to here. Yeah. And... Uh, was, my wife was editing moving in Connecticut, so I went to go visit for several weeks and actually get my most productive sketch work is when I go visit her on location. So um, I don't mind when she goes out of town to work because I go and then I get a lot done. I sit and sketch in the hotel every day. And um, this is that series of sketches. Why environments? Um, I, you know, yeah, I know. It's like all like what, mechs and vehicles to mm -hmm. this point and then switch to environments. Um, you know, I actually really like doing environmental work. And um, it, you know what? The fun thing about doing environments for me, the most fun part about it, is um, it's like you get to travel to a different world. Yeah. Right? And, and it's the narrative that you get to play in your mind. And they're, they're, they have to be like the best thing to draw for escapism. Yeah. Right? To just go and say, oh, I had to, you know, I was having a shitty day and I had to go out and fix the damn, you know, Solar cortex. Moisture evaporators. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> that's what that is. <laughs> yes. That's the mini Terraformer T2000. Yeah. And um, so it, it allows you to They're explore. They're glitchy, those. by the way. They're really things. glitchy. That's why I had to fix it again. Yeah. And you can imagine, is it, you know, are you the character and you're investigating this world? Um, are you the pilot of that airship? Right? Um, or are you seeing other people in that world? You're and, such and, a child. Yes. You need to grow well, up. Yeah. <laughs> And that was another page that was in the middle. Because <laughs> this is actually the next page okay. after that one. So, Wow. You know, I think the thing is that is interesting about, funny you should say that, because I think what happens with people's careers is that 
you know, you go out and you go to, you grow up, right? And you go to college and you, you go and, or go apprentice somewhere and learn a skill and go out and apply your trade and it turns into a career, mm -hmm. right? And then you, you stay on that career path and eventually after a while, you've done a lot of those kind of jobs and you're like, well, is this what it's going to be for the rest? You know, is this all it is? And is yeah. this what I'm going to do until I'm done, right? And I think once you kind of get to that point, you say, what was I doing when I was 10 or 12 years old? Mm -hmm. Oh, damn, that was, I was really happy doing those activities. Well, I'm going to try to get back to that, right? And so in a way, you have to almost adopt the mentality of the imagination you had when you were 10. Yeah. And if you can get to that place with the kind of design and hand skills, right, and the design methodology that we use now and the imagination sort of that you had when you were 10 or 12, it's really, really fun. Yeah. And um, I know that's when I enjoy drawing and designing the most is when I can just get back to that place. I just did a workshop in Melbourne, and it was a few workshops, but the one that was, I think, the most interesting to me and pleasurable, there was about, my numbers are going to be off, but I think there was about 100 to 200 kids age 6 to 12, and they were given a task of um, address a solution and figure out how to resolve whatever, excuse me, address a problem yes. and figure out how to resolve it. And it was everything from my sister's noisy, so i got to come up with an invention to make her quiet without snuffing her out. Right, right, without suffocation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and what was so great about it is I, I would go table to table and listen to these kids, and it was unedited, unbridled, crazy solutions that were just a reminder of what I personally need to get back. And it's just what you were saying. And that is the ability to think like a kid because you don't restrict yourself with your, your you know, contemporary knowledge of what cannot be done. I know. You can really constrain yourself. And, you know, and that really hurts lateral thinking, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's in, for industrial design methodology, we're all about lateral thinking, right? And looking at a problem from a different point of view. And um, it's very hard to shift your perspective when you sort of get set in your ways. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know, if you have drawing skills, the sketchbook is a great place to exercise that experimentation. And if you can let yourself go, and it's kind of like sketching with your opposite hand, your non-dominant hand. Like if I sketch with my left hand, I get awful looking sketches, but I get interesting shapes because I have no preconceived ideas yeah. that, the, that the sketch should be any good. And so... Are these tightrope workers in training? Yeah, those are actually, those are actually like comic, uh, you know, like weightlifters. And they, get, they have their big, uh, those are like Russian, you know, maybe Bulgarian weightlifter guys with the, you know, the big, the, yeah. the Olympic weightlifters. Yep. Yeah. I thought and they so, were learning how to tightrope. No, that's how they get so good. They carry those things across Siberia. And they, they, that's why they're so incredibly strong. Noted. Yeah. And that's a sketch that didn't work. But, but it does. You know, it works, uh, you know, from a value standpoint compared to this. Of course, yeah, that's the foreground. You can't, you can't not see it compared to that one. It's like my grandmother's but, apartment. Yeah, the thing that didn't work there was the form language, the shape language of that. I just, when you work, like, really, really high contrast, black on white, you've got to really nail the form, the shapes, mm -hmm. those edges, right? And that's what I wasn't happy with. Whereas, like, this has a much more appealing silhouette. Yeah, something new. But it, and it tells a story of a lifeguard tower to me. Yeah. Too bad that wasn't what I was going for. But. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, here I ran out of marker. So oh, no. <laughs> usually I like to do So I was stuck in Connecticut. Yeah, I was going to say, you were in a storm. So I'm in Hurricane Sandy, stuck. Uh, Italy canceled, uh, got my trip canceled because I was stuck there in the hurricane. Couldn't get my flight out. Uh, so I had to skip Luca Comics and Games last year. And so it meant more drawing time on the upside. Mm -hmm. The problem was I ran out of markers. That's bad news. And, and so that meant uh, going to Ballpoint. For a couple of days. Why couldn't you use, like, be innovative in the field and just like make some, some Egg real tempera dark, some, some dark coffee and a, and a, you know, and a brush, <laughs> toothbrush even. I, I, I suppose I, I let myself down a little yeah, bit. Yeah. You know, I Kevin really, Llewellyn would do that. I know. I, yeah. I, I loved his, he has a sketchbook where he uses coffee to, uh, to, to basically do, do watercolor. Washes, yeah. Watercolor washes. Yeah. I should have because markers are basically watercolor, right? Yeah. They're just permanent watercolors. Yeah. Although this paper, I think, would and you look apart. really cool and bohemian. That's but true. Only to Melissa because you're uh, in a hotel room. That's so. right. Yeah. <laughs> and the, but the hat gets uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> My beret. 
So, so now, what's, because I went ballpoint, you can see it's really hard to communicate environments without a little bit of value, right? That works so much better when you add a little bit of atmospheric yeah. perspective, right? So when you work that contrast from here to here, um, you immediately get that depth in like this one. But um, when I was starting to do it here, it's like, oh, you know what? It's going to take too much with a ballpoint to outline everything. And it's like, uh, I'd rather just do it with value. So knowing I would just scan those later and I could do it in Photoshop. So I switched gears and went to vehicles uh, for like a week, mm -hmm. for my last week there. And so these are all about uh, trucks. And so I love this old uh, cab over engine. It's like COE mm -hmm. is the, the short nomenclature for it. The old like 1948 Ford trucks that have a, a big cab right over the engine. And um, I always imagine what would they look like, you know, without any bed on them or anything. And what if we had like a more sci-fi version of that? Yeah. And that's the simple design, you know, brief is to do sci-fi cab over engine trucks. And so that's, that's what these are. I like this. So, yeah, this got a little bit of retro thing. I mean, that's very much the sort of classic. That's more like maybe mid 50s inspired um, for the cab. Mm -hmm. And this is just kind of like retro futurism in a way. Yeah. You know, it's very familiar geometric shapes. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a fairly simple aesthetic to do compared to like getting something like this to look good is much tougher with all the angular faceted surfaces. This is more in the, if I can make the reference, but Daniel Simon vocabulary. Yeah, yeah, especially this centerpiece right here. Mm -hmm. right? That's what I mean. It's very geometric, cut lines, very controlled, that sort of thing. Now, is this bad perspective or a soft yeah. suspension? <laughs> That's a very soft suspension and maybe even a partial uh, flat left front. <laughs> <laughs> I would not... He's He's breaking into a right-hand turn. Yes, that would be uh, something that might be a little scary to drive. Yeah, I can hear it. Yeah. It's like the, uh, what was that? It was the Batmobile that did it or the motorcycle that did it? As it chirps across the, uh, the cement? This is like that French, like the 2CV, the, the, uh, that car in the Citroën, the old one. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> Every time you corner the, the inside rear left wheels off yeah. the ground, yeah. that, that's maybe what that's like. Um, so these are more of the same, more sci-fi trucks, cheap tires. Yeah. So, um, it's a lot of rubber. I know. Yeah. Those are big sort of, uh, dragster yeah. tires. Anyway, so I got sort of rolling on this and then right about here, I kind of got my sketching, you know, draftsmanship and mojo going again on these because these are starting to become, you know, decent design sketches and also incredibly clean at the same time. Yeah. Which it, it's not really, to be honest, it's not a great, um, well, actually it's, it's not a uh, practical pursuit, let's say. What is? To not. do, uh, to try and do a beautiful sketch and oh. a nice design. Oh yeah. Simultaneously. It's hard. It, it's not, it, it's more of a romantic pursuit, not really a practical one. So and, unless you have already figured out the design and you're just doing kind of variations on a theme yeah and then you're doing illustration work with right very subtle styling but this right. is from scratch yeah there's no other yes i'm sort of sticking with the theme of this cab over engine concept although i move the engine away to the mid engine position but still the same proportion and you know the more practical design sketch looks like this where you like put a line there and you go no that's wrong and you draw it mm -hmm. where you want it so you have a lot more adjustments in the drawing yeah and so what i typically do is i usually uh, um sacrifice the design a little bit to make a nicer drawing. Mm -hmm. So here I don't want to put that extra line, right? Even though maybe it's where I want it. Yeah. I won't put it there because it'll ruin my drawing. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to go for a beautiful drawing at the expense of the design, knowing that the design is so subjective here anyway. And, you know, it's, it's a sort of a made up project. It's, it's easy to do. The design can almost not be wrong, but it's never that right either because I don't really have a brief. Yeah. You know, it's not for a client. So it's kind of nice to do, focus in on the drawing part. You know, it's interesting, as I look at these drawings, uh, there's something that's popping up on this page that is more obvious than some of the others, at least at this moment for me. Like the use of negative space and um, positive form, like this scoop that's on the side, mm -hmm. and how that creates or uh. echoes either one is in, in form mm. the other, the negative space, and that's makes me ask the question because i know you have you do this all the time the graphic design of this oh. 
And whenever you say graphic design, people tend to think, okay, logos or stripes, graphics, but that is not... <clears throat> That's not it. No. No, yeah, you're exactly right. It's actually... I think it's the thing that probably industrial designers don't spend enough time on. Yeah. Um, and it's actually, um, we brought up Daniel a yeah. couple minutes ago. You know, I think that really the success of so many of Daniel's designs is because he's such a good graphic designer. Yeah. In, with all the logos and the numbers and all that, but it's in the graphic arrangement of the elements like window graphics, right? Yes. That's why they're called, referred to as window graphics. But uh, scoops right? Undercuts, that still becomes a graphic shape, even though it's dictated by a form change, right? And it's in mm -hmm. shadow, that still makes a shape. Yeah. And so when you glance at something in a small sketch, it's really about the graphic design. What's the shape of this scoop, the shape of these vents, that window, right? In the relationship of these circles to that boxy shape. So that's really about graphic design. And it's the arrangement of those elements that people don't spend enough time on. Mm -hmm. And typically, what I like to, you know, do in my sketches is wherever I have a form change on the exterior of something, you brought up that little scoop thing there, is take the points and the lines and then pull those in to the to the surfaces. Mm -hmm. So the silhouette, right, really drives where I'm going to pull those lines from into the interior. Yeah. And so like all these, those could just be only on the silhouette at center line, but you could also pull them inward, right, gotcha. and make them louvered vents. Mm -hmm. And so that sort of silhouette supports the interior um, graphics in a way. So you see the, the pages are getting kind of clean mm -hmm. now and the, the you know all the, the guidelines are all in there but they're so light that they just disappear. And they, these are all uh, freehand with circle like circle guides here and ellipse guides here. That's pretty much all I use to, that I use for help are ellipse guides. They're so fast, so simple and it really you can match and bring the level of your drawing up so much by nailing all the circles, all the ellipses in your sketch, right? And then matching that to your other hand skills. Now, I bet some people will have a question, including myself, actually. You've got very different form languages, and, and it's all a four-wheel truck-like vehicle, almost utility, it looks like. But they're so very different stylistically. What inspires you or what provokes that direction versus that direction? Well, um, it's one of the things I personally like to do because a lot of the illustrations are just for books. So I want the range to inspire and um, help educate others into pushing their aesthetic. Mm -hmm. And it's not for a specific project. Um, so nothing's been dictated on the art direction side. Right. right. So there's the freedom in the initial flexibility because it's just a sketchbook. Yeah. But um, I like to experiment, I guess, and I get bored with one. I don't, I'm not so into really aesthetics and styling that I have just one favorite aesthetic. Mm -hmm. um, and so I actually, what I prefer to do is push my range and force myself to try and do, if I did a round one, which was maybe inspired by an old uh, Huey helicopter or something, mm -hmm. right, kind of cockpit. And so by in, uh, sorry to interrupt, but by inspired, it's inspired in your memory bank. You're yeah, not correct. No, opening yeah, up a book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, none of this is looking at anything. There's no reference. Right. Looking, um, I don't look at, I really, you know, it's probably smarter to work from reference, to be honest. It's more practical and it's a smarter way to work. But you've, you've also studied it and looked at it enough that you've got a, you've got a reference point in your head that if you love something, you can go back to reference. And correct. Yeah, and so at a certain point, it does sort of become, you know, in there enough that you can pull out those shapes. And that's typically what I do, is I just start with an aesthetic theme, mm -hmm. but not really for, based on art history or anything like that, really just based on form. So I'll say, everything's going to be round and kind of chunky, right? And then I'll say, okay, everything's going to be linear, um, and I've got these sort of curved lines that come from the bottom. So, and then everything's going to be straight lines and very linear, and so this mm -hmm. one's very faceted looking. And then I'm saying, well, I'll do the opposite of that. So even though it's almost the exact same proportion, and it's yeah. the, almost the exact same silhouette, right? It's got this little notch with a sun, mm -hmm. sun visor over the back. It's like a little back patio. Because these are like campers, yeah. kind of. And so and it's got the same ground clearance, right? Almost the same wheelbase. But all the form language, right, is different. And this antenna goes backward, and this one goes forward. So it's, it really almost is the opposite. But they mm -hmm. share all the same sort of packaging and engineering characteristics, but all the forms are different. And so I really just think about lines. Yeah. And then those, I try to stick with those lines for all the details and everything. 
And this one's unfortunately a little bit, it's the larger drawing, but it's a little confused. Some of these are actually better designs. This one's actually that close to that one. Mm -hmm. um, pretty close. I was trying probably to draw this yeah, one looks in like perspective. It. Yeah. More sci-fi trucks. <laughs> and so now I'm moving around, so I'm visiting. And so here's like an example of the opposite, right? So if I'm going to do this cab forward, or here I do it at the back, and then I'll move it to the front. Look at this. You probably did. Yeah, yeah so I'm not, I'm not I talking to, to you. I think I'm I had to see it. I'm talking to you guys. Look at this. That is gorgeous. Oh, well, thanks. I mean, it's, it's a cool design, but it's so well crafted. Yeah, that's a little bit of a challenging uh, perspective to do because you have to like pay attention to mirroring everything because you can see it all on oh, the other yeah. side, right? Something like this, you can hide a lot more because you only see just a little bit of it here and there. But that you can't really escape from. Oh yeah, the bloaty. Yeah, yeah, then like the little, little like uh, puffer fish. That's right. Puffer fish with wheels. <laughs> right? And look at here, it's the little box fish. Uh huh. Right, it's a little mouth there. Yeah, yeah. poor little guy. That was That's cool. cool. But I had a nice line quality moment on that sketch. And then these are actually really fun to uh, just scan them and start painting in Photoshop because mm -hmm. you have everything there and you throw some textures on it and weather it up and add your lighting. Those are a lot of fun. Intentionally narrow front. Um, probably of... not. It's, it's, this is a bit of a cheat, I would say. Um, it's probably not that accurately drawn. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that what's happening here is this looks like it's drawn with a wide angle lens, right? Yeah. Because I see a lot of the rear wheel here. And this would be, you know, if I hit that, this would be accurate for a wide angle lens, right? Because you could mm -hmm. actually look straight on at the rear wheel and see these separate, yeah, right? right. Um, but if it was, but now I look at the body, it doesn't really look like it's drawn with a wide angle lens. It looks more like a telephoto. Yes. Right? So I think this is like a hybrid cheat where the body feels like a long lens because I'm not really seeing up into the visor that much for right. how much shadow I see. And then there's assumptions about the, the contour lines here yes. versus here. That, yeah. that describes that you're seeing more front. Right. And you don't really know because this could cut backwards a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah. So those could be accurate. But it really what the giveaway is you don't see enough of the underside of this, right? Mm -hmm. compared to how much of the shadows. So the shadow says that the horizon, based on the wheels, says it's right here at the top of the tires. Mm -hmm. But with the horizon line there, that means, you know, if I see this much of the shadow that far away from the horizon, and if we go up the same distance, I should see the full width there. Mm -hmm. So when I get, by the time I get all the way up to here, I should see a lot more. Yeah. So what I should do, if I wanted to sell this as being more accurate and leave the tires where they are, I would have to foreshorten across the silhouette, everything across the top, and especially the back. Yes. So, but the thing is, oh, I wanted to show those scoop, those vents, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to have those notch in and detailed, so it f starts to feel more like a side view. Yeah. Because I didn't want to hide them. Right. And so it's definitely a cheat. Whereas this starts to get more accurate, because see here, it's that curve for mm -hmm. the hatch, right? It feels like we're looking up at that guy, and I see yeah. his chin, right? That sort of thing. So this is a little more accurate. This is a little bit better, those, the spacing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the side views you take a lot of, you know, a lot of artistic license. That's probably a little more accurate. This one's accurate, but for a super wide-angle fisheye lens yeah. kind of thing. That's just not even. That's probably tucking in too far. And again, it's sort of a challenging, you know, three-point perspective drawing. That's a fun sketch, but it's really pretty whacked when you really analyze it. Um, but I, f I painted that one up. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, I, I fixed it in Photoshop. I just, okay. I just lifted the back and. I yeah. corrected it a bit, which, you know, you can do. It's totally, you know, there's no rules. And um, it's really easy and fun to fix your drawings inside Photoshop. If it feels right, then, nah, I, I, I'm going to retract that statement. Because sometimes it feels right to people with bad eyes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, well, those ellipses look right. No, I'm sorry, yeah. they're totally wrong. <laughs> <Unacceptable>. <laughs> the wheels don't roll. Here's, here's some drawings. This is what they look like before I get to doing the line work and before I use the ellipse guides. And I didn't like either of those sketches. So that's why they didn't get finished. This one looks like an anteater. I was say, it's just, <laughs> just like awful. I saw like a horse I know, it's just really anteater awful. thing. Yeah, and I didn't use... So that, that's kind of the first block in. Very light, you know, pen over the light marker. Then if I like it, it sort of gets this treatment or this one. I like this graphic element here. That nice panel. Yeah, that just sort of came in from the, the mm -hmm. outside. That's and, nice. Um, yeah, that's, that's where I add the line work. There's another uh, sort of unfinished page as well. Um, like the side view was only sort of 
acceptable one. Why did you abandon these guys? Um, I because the. You know, I mean, the narrative could have totally called for it, right? But I just didn't mm -hmm. feel like drawing a little sad, ugly, misproportioned sci-fi vehicle. That's often the brief I get. We'd like a sad, ugly, misproportioned design. Yeah. Okay, I can do that. No, it's totally appropriate. You can get the, the script or the video game brief can call for that, right? Yeah. And you need, and you need targets. You need fodder, right? Yes. For some things. So <laughs> it's totally appropriate. To, that could be perfect for the narrative and the story. If you're an ugly vehicle, you must be shot. Yeah, I just didn't feel like, you know, finishing it. Mm -hmm. And here I actually demoed just how to do line work to get it to pop a bit. As yeah. I just was in Toronto giving a workshop and flipping through the sketchbook, and I paused on that to show, to explain that. In which we're going to be doing a workshop. Talking very about soon. Very soon, in a month. Yep. Uh, Taipei for the first week of July. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be exciting because we, we actually have a lot of workshops within. That. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's... We're doing like a whole week's worth there. Um, at a bunch of events, you know, together, and then Sparth's going to come join us and a couple other people for, yeah. for the weekend component. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be fun to get back to teaching together out on the, you know, on the road, on the road, on foreign soils. Yeah, it's going to be good fun. Sci-fi hot rod again. Mm -hmm. More sci-fi trucks. I don't see, yeah, it's just more of the same. These are notes for the uh, how to draw book, I'm talking about how does top view relate to your station point where you're standing in draft view, short lens versus long lens, and how does that affect the view across the other side of the car? How much of that are you covering in the book? Yeah, I'm putting in all of it as much as I can, uh, the amount of time we have left to finish it, which is like three weeks, and the amount of pages we have. So I, I didn't even see the name. And I thought, wait a minute. Dan Kornstrom. Yeah. yeah totally. <laughs> um, lists of things to draw. So as I'm doing these drawings, then I'm writing lists about, you know, what do you have to think about, et cetera, what I'm going to put in the book. Wow. And so more. Hold on now. I gotta take this in. That's beautiful. Oh thanks. All of it is. Yeah, it was a that was pretty that was a that was at home on the kitchen table sort of drawing evening. It begs the question. Nine nos? No no no, it's actually an S. It's a S N O Z. Snoz. Snoz. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> it's just the monster snoz Got on it. that one. Yeah, those are those are fun, and I like this is one of my favorite perspective views of vehicles is that put the VP just above the rear wheels, mm -hmm. um, almost sort of the same height as the wheel, and you see it sort of here again, and there it is, and and then do a lot of wide angle lens because you get the nice rake to the front. Uh, if you flip it around, you get the reverse, and you lose the rake of the vehicle. And so yes. when I draw from the front three quarter, I tend to draw with a long lens like this, much slower convergence because you can still get the rake because mm -hmm. if you have a bigger rear wheel. Right, and you do a wide angle lens, yeah. those wheels become the same size. Yeah, neither can't tell. And you can't tell, and it really screws up. It's really difficult to get that feel of direction and motion uh, in the front three quarter in a wide angle lens because it just makes the front snaz even bigger, right? <laughs> Did you make that observation via photography or via drawing? Um, probably photography, and, yeah. then, and then trying to draw views that you go out, probably while doing the photography myself. Because I found that in my adult years of design, I found that photography has been so incredibly valuable from the standpoint of learning about lensing, oh, yeah. learning about composition from yep. shooting, and mm -hmm. of course lighting. No, I think it's all, I mean, it's obviously all connected. And what you're trying to do when you draw is you're trying to emulate things that are real. Exactly, it's and a virtual so photograph. It, all the time. And so you're always picking, when I do that sketch, I'm picking the camera. Mm -hmm. You know, the vanishing point isn't gonna move between uh, different lens lengths. Right. Mm -hmm. If it's in an environment, the VP is going to be there if I'm standing next to this vehicle. But what's going to change is right the amount of convergence yep. based on the lens. And so that's incredibly helpful to think about lenses. And that's the very first thing you do when you set your grid is pick your, pick your lens. And mm -hmm. then everything has to follow that after if you want it to make it feel real. Otherwise, you end up with that, that puffer fish vehicle that has right. you know, two lenses working. And sometimes in an environment, that's... A, it's nice to be able to do that in a perspective sketch, to cheat. Yeah. Um, now to airplanes. So in this book, we're almost at the end of the book. We're almost out of time. So um, airplanes, these are all for the How to Draw book. I wanted to do a, cool. a, a chapter on sketching aircraft. So they're fun things to construct and draw. And they're, um, so again, same light marker, ballpoint pen. Paper airplane was actually a really simple demo to do, but it's actually incredibly educational. Yeah. So it gives you all the basic uh, planes, no pun intended, mm -hmm. of wings, fuselage, tail, those sort of things, very easy to see. 
So these are the notes and my steps for that, um, for the book. Some pre-sketching. Uh, drawing from observation, uh, that's again for the book to explain how to build your visual library. So there's two pages there, drawing, not, that's not I was going to say, where, where were <laughs> what you? What airplane is that? I want to yeah, go there. That would be a toy. Mm -hmm. um, no, those two were semi-real. And then these are a couple kind of real ones, but also made up at this mm -hmm. point a little I bit. I love that one. Um, but these are all sort of based on real planes, uh, prototypes of old planes. Like and that's it. So, fun. so end of the sketchbook. I'm, I got, it looks like I have a two, I have a couple pages left if I want them. But it, those last three you can never really draw on because they, they get too thin and there's not enough pad. So. And see, it, for me, it's the last three and the first 97. Yeah, they yeah, well, trip me up. Yeah, they can be tricky. Uh, thank you. Because... Oh, thanks, Nev. Yeah, it was fun. Glad you came by today. I needed a free tutorial Friday. Yeah. On our friend Imre Molnar's birthday. Yes, happy so, birthday, Imre. Here's to you, Em. Wish you were here. Yeah. But uh, we looked at some drawings today, so he'd be happy with us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he would end it with, right. Excellent. Right. All right. Thanks, Nev. Thanks, Nev, and uh, thank you, Scott. That was we'll, inspiring. We'll uh, start planning for Taiwan, and well, we've already planned, but we will start planning. Taiwan and hot rods of another hot rods of another world someday. Yeah, thank you.